I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Delighted to have the chance to speak with Dr. Huda Zogby today for this conversation with Giants in Medicine. Zogby is a pediatric neurologist and HHMI investigator at Baylor College of Medicine and the founding director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital. She uses genetic and biochemical approaches to explore the pathogenesis of polyglutamine neurodegenerative disorders like Rett syndrome and spinocerebellar ataxia. Her discoveries have provided new ways of thinking about more common neurodegenerative diseases like autism and Parkinson's disease and may pave the way for new therapeutics. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Can you start by telling me a little bit about your childhood and your parents? Sure. So I, grew, I was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. I grew up there. Um, my parents, uh, neither of them is a scientist. My dad uh, was a businessman, worked in extraction of olive oil from olives. That was his business and making soap. But he loved uh, learning. So grew up in a household where the library was floor to ceiling full of books and he read a lot. So he was really a scholar in many ways, although he did not really pursue uh, an academic career. My mother was a housewife and however, she was the one who was through her children insistent that we take an academic path. So both of my parents were just nurturing, loving parents and none of them, nobody was in the medical field actually in my family. And so when you were a child, were you into science and mathematics and nature or was your bent more towards literature and arts? I think as a child, I, like, I liked more the sciences. So I always loved the biology classes and enjoyed them. So throughout childhood, I would say that was more of my bent and I liked math. I grew up to like literature more when I was in high school. That's when I really appreciated literature, both Arabic literature and English literature, but more so I became enamored with English literature. So my path, you know, in Lebanon, in high school, you can take three paths. You can take the mathematic path or the literary, literary philosophy path or the biological sciences path. I took that particular path but it was doing that path. It's still a wide, broad education. You know, you're exposed to literature, and that's when I really became fascinated by literature and had decided if I went to college, I want to major in literature and writing. Um, but you were dissuaded from this path by your mother. That is correct. That's correct. She, we had a lot of discussions, and she kept insisting since I'm good at biology, which I think she recognized probably from my childhood years, I should really consider doing medicine. And I kept telling her, but I really love literature, I want to write. And she said, well, that can be your hobby. You can do that on the side, but you really have to do something where you can have an independent career and you're good at biology and it's really an easy career. That, those, I will never forget her words. She said, it's a much simpler career if you do it this way. So I said, okay, you know, after, you know, I yielded, not easily, but she, you know, she was persevering and had a few tears and I've decided that's it. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go into medical school. So you find yourself in medical school in Beirut and what year was this? 76. 76. And within the first two years, out broke an enormous Correct. war. Correct. Within our first year of medical school, uh, the, halfway in that, during that year, the civil war broke up. So what was that experience like, trying to go to medical school in a time of war? It was really tough. It was uh, very different. We were a class of 63 students, and we had to make a decision whether to stay and finish the year or disperse and everybody goes home. Because many of the students who were on campus could not anymore, many were commuting students and could not commute anymore because of the green line and all the danger they would encounter. So really, collectively, we had to make that decision together with our professors. So we all made the decision to stay. And with that decision came figuring ways where to stay because some of us did not have dorm rooms. 
So we had to find places to stay that are safe. Um, the professors all lived on campus or very close to campus. Um, once we made the decision, really, that our life became going to school and together at night, staying together in a safe place, avoiding the bombs that are falling all around us in the city. So what was the safe place you found to stay? I lived in a bathroom. Well, it was, it was a closed room within the bathroom, but it was indeed in a bathroom. And I had put a sleeping bag on the floor and uh, stayed there. So after the first year was over, and it's the summer, right? and you're going home then to live at home as opposed Correct. to on campus, and what happened then? So just before the year was over, um, in the spring, my younger brother, who was in high school at the time, um, was injured. The shrapnel hit him, and my parents really, that came too close to home. They were very upset about that. And um, so the plan was, when the school year ended, we should all maybe leave for the summer, hoping the war will end that summer. By the end of summer, we can come back. So. Uh, school year ended and my younger brothers and I were supposed to leave. Of course, the airport is closed, so we had to go at the time via Syria by car. And then from Syria, go to Europe where I met up with my uncle, stayed with my uncle for a few days. And from there, then um, came to the United States where I had a sister in Austin. So it was a multi, you know, hop uh, trip. Um, and it was hard. It was a really hard trip for many, many reasons. Uh, I would say one hardship, you know, I had amazing classmates. I had uh, just met my boyfriend who I started dating and I really liked him. So now I have to, to leave. And uh, my brothers were young. It was hard of them, on them to leave. One was 15 and one was 10. And none of us are that experienced to really be international travelers during a state of war, leaving parents behind, not knowing what's going to happen. So it was a pretty sad time, I recall, Hell, and a pretty, pretty hard time. Um, so I, I truly left hoping that it'll be just a month or two, and for sure people will come to their senses and the war will be over by October when the school year would start and we will all come back home. So, but, that but, but that was not the case. So you live with your sister through the summer and... Right. So I, I stayed with her through the summer and I was hoping every day that things will get better so that I can return to my medical school in October. But things did not get better, it actually got much worse. So although we left via Syria by October, now things were tense between Syria and Lebanon and the border became very dangerous and close, so I couldn't now fly back to Syria and get back home. So really there was no way to get back home safely without challenges at that point in time, and no, nobody wanted us home. They said, just find schools, do something, and stay there. So my youngest brother, it was easy, he was in middle school, and the, uh, the one in high school, it wasn't also as hard. The challenge was for me, finding a medical school in October after all medical schools have been in session. I didn't know medical school here starts in August and Lebanon started in October. So we had to really figure what am I to do? And I quickly realized there isn't one in Austin. So I had no options there. And uh, it was hard to find a medical school that might consider you so late in the game. And that's when I became really very sad and despondent and crying. And a friend of the family in Nashville said, you know, come visit us, spend the weekend with us. I think he was worried about me. He figured he'll cheer me up. So I went to visit him and he said, I have a friend who worked for Hospital Corporation of America. Let's go ask him about medical schools in Nashville. So we go up and he says, go try Vanderbilt. So I went to Vanderbilt and asked them, would you take me as a transfer student? They said, we don't take transfer students. And even if we did, we won't take them two months late. But you could try this other medical school not too far from here, maybe they will consider you. So my friend, uh, Kaspar, the friend of the family, took me there and we went and uh, told them my story and they were intrigued and they said, you know, school started two months ago, but we're gonna take you. So and this is Mahari Medical, Medical College. College. right. 
So I was really shocked and flabbergasted that I was accepted on the spot. I mean, I had my grades. I, you know, my family sent by telex. There was no fax then. <laughs> telex, my grades, and I had that and shared it with them, my transcript. And they said, we'll take you. So you can start tomorrow. So this is the late 70s, early 80s. Right. And you find yourself at a historically black medical school. So what was that like as someone who just said that it was perhaps a little bit difficult to adjust to a completely different culture? Right. I think that it was really different. I, first of all, I did not understand much about the issues of minority and you know, race and all that. In, in the Middle East and in Lebanon, you know, we're all different shades. Basically, you start from the very blonde, blue-eyed. I have my grandmother who's blonde, blue-eyed, to me a little bit dark, and there are members of my family who are a little bit darker. So you really don't think of people exactly in the same context as I was introduced to here. So the idea that there is, you know, historically African-American medical school and that minorities really had challenges fitting, you know, and being accepted into mainstream schools was totally new to me. So I had to first adjust and understand all these concepts. To me, it was an American medical school. And I thought, for sure, you know, it's just, they're all the same. And I was really young and naive because in, in Lebanon, you do, you know, if you've taken AP classes and if you are doing pre-med and you do well, you basically spend two years in college. So I was relatively young still mm -hmm. and really has not, have not traveled much outside uh, Lebanon. So it was really a huge change and a new experience. So I found myself, I, I slowly be, became aware that there are all these historical things that I did not know about. And it is interesting to be a minority within a minority also, because I, I stood out. Clearly I stood out <laughs> from every angle. Culturally, there are many things I did not understand that are purely American. You know, it's not that uh, you know, if you grew up elsewhere, it's not the same coming here as, you know, when you're early 21, 22 year old. So, um, the, you know, it, it took a while for me to adjust and, and adapt. I was very uh, touched by how well I was received. So I must say everybody was really welcoming. They wanted to take me out every night and I never went out anywhere because I was just petrified as two months behind on class. I have to catch up on all my classes and I was so homesick. So basically I would go home and study and tears will pour over the books because I really was worried about the family back home, missing my friends, feeling very isolated and lonely. So I didn't do much of socializing. I just stayed alone that year. It was a tough year. So I navigated it by simply studying, doing my best, thinking if I do well, maybe I'll go back mm -hmm. the end of the year to Lebanon. But you ended up staying through and graduating and your boyfriend at the time then joined you there. Correct, correct. correct. I did pack all my things and went back home that summer, and I really was determined to go back home. But my professors at the American University of Beirut told me, you know, this war is staying, and it's going to be long, and you'll be better off graduating from an American medical school, so go back. And that's when then William uh, also applied and transferred. Yeah. So did that make the final two years a little bit easier? Yes, having, you know, one close friend, someone you, you know, love and so on, was much, much easier than being all alone in a, in a city that's also lacked in international breadth. Houston now is much easier. Nashville back then, you know, you didn't find all the ethnic food you grew up with and all of that was different. So where during this path then did you decide, I think I want to do a residency in pediatrics or cardiology? Mm. Or right. So during this path, is, it was during my fourth year of medical school. Uh, during my fourth year of medical school, I spent it at various medical schools. I spent it at Stanford, Emory, and Baylor College of Medicine, taking electives in different endocrine, OB, etc. And it was during my visit to Baylor College of Medicine on the pediatric cardiology rotation that I fell in love with pediatric cardiology and really enjoyed that month of intern sub-internship as a medical student. And I think both me and the faculty clicked and we decided this is it. 
this is, I found my passion, I'm gonna do this. And the chair of pediatrics, then Ralph Feigen, called me into his office and asked me, you know, what can we do to see you here? And I told him, I, I love this place. It was really one of the premier places for pediatric cardiology. So I said, you know, hopefully if the match puts us together, I'll be here. And that's why I joined Baylor to really become a pediatric cardiologist. So you come back to Texas and you've really almost never left um, yes. for your professional career. But then where along the way did you decide to take a detour away from cardiology towards neurology? Yes. So this, is, this goes to show you the value of mentors, right? So uh, I, as a pediatric resident, you have to rotate on many different subspecialties. And I rotated on the neurology specialty and Marvin Fishman had just arrived as the new chief of pediatric neurology. He came from Washington University and he's really one of the leaders in the field, fantastic uh, clinician and, and teacher. And I remember vividly always on rounds, we had a lot of cardiac patients with neurological problems and I'm always fascinated by the heart and telling him about, about the heart and he's teasing me, why do we get always focus on that stupid organ, let's talk about the brain. So we had always a whole month of a tug of war between the brain and the heart. I'm rooting that the heart is for more interesting and he's trying to teach me how the brain is for far more interesting. And the rotation ended and I thought that's the end of it. I will now go back, you know, find and learn some neurology. But that's really, it was after the end of that rotation through really learning from Marv and being uh, with him on the rounds, I, I missed the, the challenge of neurology. I miss the process, how you really examine a patient, take a history first, and from the history you try to solve the, the puzzle. And gradually then you examine them and you fine tune it. We used to take pride in trying to come up with the diagnosis with minimal amount of tests, because really it's, a, it's that the kind of specialty that it is sometimes for certain uh, you know, clinical problems. And I missed that. I found that the most stimulating experience during my residency. So at the end of the year, I've decided, okay, I think I really missed that and I want to go back and I applied for child neurology. So where along the way then did you say, okay, I'm going to go for a pediatric neurology. Maybe I should also do some research. Okay. So it happened. You know, I, I, I didn't really make the decision, as you can tell, I don't make many decisions myself. <laughs> Only of late I make decisions. But what happened is I started the pediatric neurology residency and I enjoyed it very much. But during that period, I really started feeling the pain in that specialty. And particularly sitting with parents at the time, remember this is now early 80s, 1983, where you're seeing children with devastating neurological disorders and you're telling the parent your child has a problem, they can't see, they have intellectual disability. We don't know the cause of it, but we think this is genetic and you can tell them there's a one in two chance or a one in four chance this will happen again. But we really can't help you also about that. That was the state of affairs. It's hard to believe that's how it was, where we suspect either from the family history or having two kids in a family and so on and so forth that this is genetic, but we have no idea what it is. We might put a name on it. We still don't have the cause and we don't have any treatment. And, you know, Texas Children's being a very large hospital referral center, that's what you're seeing all the time. You're not seeing this the easy to treat epilepsies and headaches and so on. You're seeing these devastating disorders. And that really, it started eating me up, just telling parents bad news and going home and telling my husband how much I'm suffering. And, and I, I would be in tears over some bad news I've delivered that day. And it was that together with me becoming fascinated with Rett syndrome after seeing girls with Rett syndrome, the combination of those I've decided, you know, there's just no way I can continue as a clinician, 100%. I really have to do something about this and have to go and get tooled up to do research. I can figure out what's wrong with these patients and maybe we can do something to help. And I basically conferred with William, who was then my husband, and we 
he said, you're miserable. I mean, you have to do something. You can't continue like this, you know, feeling so sad for the patients, feeling that you can't do anything. So he was very supportive that I will take on a research track and get trained in research. So you approached Arthur Baudet to do a postdoctoral fellowship and get some training in genetics. He asked me, what do you want to work on? And I was so excited. I told him I want to work on Rett syndrome. By then I have seen hundreds or more patients and I have been convinced this must be genetic because they're all girls. So I started, you know, uh, logging them in, want to collect blood so that I can you know, take DNA and hopefully one day find the gene for Red Syndrome. So I told him I want to work on Red Syndrome and I have a lot of families, I've identified a lot of individuals. He goes, show me. So I said, well, they're all these individual cases. They're all one in each family. And he looked at me, this is 1985 now, and you can't really go after a gene when there's no map, nothing. And he says, no, you can't work on this. This is not tractable. You're going to burn your career. You need to pick a tractable problem. Um, he was very kind to offer me any project in his lab. He was trying to clone cystic fibrosis. He was working on urea cycle defect. And I told him, no, uh, that really doesn't resonate with my interest because of neurology. I want some problem that really resonates um, and fascinates me. So. Uh, we talked, and I told him I'm interested in, in dominant neurodegenerative diseases, and uh, Mendelian disease would be ideal because Huntington was just mapped. So I figured if I can find a disease like Huntington, but not Huntington, knowing there are many big labs working on it, and I'm starting from scratch. So uh, there was a family in Texas that had a dominantly inherited balance disorder, spinocerebellar ataxia. And Art was aware of that family uh, from the genetics clinic, so we talked about that. And I said, I'd like to pursue cloning the spinocerebellar ataxia gene. And he was really open. Again, that's where I would give him another truckload of credit because he's a, you know, his expertise in, in biochemical and metabolic genetics and was interested in cystic fibrosis. Here I come bringing a dominant neurological disorders. I want to clone that gene. And he was really very supportive and very open that I would be able to do so. So I did, that's why I started working on spinocerebellar ataxia. And the family lived an hour north of uh, the city. So I would drive there, examine everybody, and collect blood samples, bring them to the lab, and so on. Where along this process did you start collaborating with your long-term collaborator, Harry Orr, who's in Minnesota? Yes, that's a wonderful story. My, sto my collaboration with Harry is one of the dearest things to my heart. It's, I would say it's one of the highlights of my um, you know, scientific career. Um, so I, I started working on spinocerebella ataxia, and I found a paper about a family in Minnesota that has been mapped with spinocerebral ataxia. And I heard from various genetics meetings, people told me, oh, there's this guy in Minnesota, Harry Orr. He, I think he was associate professor at the time, who is working on spinocerebral ataxia. And of course, my first reaction, I was petrified. Here's this established, well-trained scientist, unlike me, who's barely learning her way around the lab. Um, so he's already working on spinal cerebral ataxia, and what am, I, what am I to do? You know, how will I catch up with him? How will I deal with them? I was very timid about it, but I figured, well, he has a family, I have a family, we'll both work, and we'll see where that will get us. And along the line, at, uh, with time, you know, we started mapping our families, and because of a, a funny coincidence in my family where a person who married into the family brought the disease also. So my family had the disease, dominant disease, but a spouse also brought the disease in, which you would never think about that. But, and that spouse died before he developed symptoms. Mm -hmm. It got the mapping in my family in a different part of the chromosome 6. So they both mapped to chromosome 6, but because of that twist, it mapped mine to a different region for chromosome 6. And back then, there were not many DNA markers. And David Cox, a wonderful geneticist, had developed a technology where you can develop markers called radiation hybrids. And I would never forget when I read his paper, and I liked his technology, I said, I can use it and maybe develop markers for chromosome 6. 
And David, I, I read the protocol and there's some things were not clear to me. And I always like to do an experiment that will work because I read the protocol, if I, I don't understand something, I worry it may not work. So I picked up the phone and called up David and he answered the phone and I told him, I'm, I'm you know, a postdoc doing this and I really would love to learn how to do the technique well successfully and David walked me through it step by step on the phone down to tell me the secret of how fast I should put you know a certain chemical on the cells when I'm doing this so I did it and it succeeded and I created a lot of uh, resources for chromosome 6 and that's when I thought well I have all these resources for chromosome 6 and Harry Orr is trying to clone the gene his locus is different than mine because we mapped it in different regions. Maybe I should you know, call him up and offer some of these tools and he could use them. So I called him up and I told him, look, I work on this, but I think my family mapped differently than yours. Here are these hybrids if you'd like to use them. And he did and he was very you know, grateful that we will collaborate if I send him this on his uh, you know, uh, mapping using the tools. And for a couple of years we worked on this and he was working on his own region and I'm working on my own region. And then one day I decided, it bugged me back then, this was the first ataxia gene to be mapped, it bugged me that in the same disease mapping on two different regions of the chromosome, I thought something is wrong and that's when I did a lot of detective work to discover that in a small branch the disease did not come through the bloodline that carries the whole muta genetic mutation, but came from a spouse who died before ever being affected. That was really mm -hmm. detective work. Once I put that model in, it became clear my gene maps on top of Harry's gene, the same family. So I realized that in 1988, so it's now a couple of years later, uh, and I called him up. I, decided, I was excited, I said I would tell him so I called him up and I told him, you know, the story and he, his first reaction when I told him, he said, do you want your radiation hybrids back? And I said, no, no, but I think now we can collaborate. Now we're both working on the same gene. So how about if we both collaborate and work on this together? And I, he calls this the call, you know, he will never forget the call and I will never forget the silence for about maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 seconds. He was processing all this information and he said, let's do it. And we did. And uh, so that was 88. We published our first two papers back to back because we both showed now, we found a marker that showed that. And then by collaborating, he had the families that helped us map the boundary and I had all the tools to really physically map the whole tile, the boundary. And we, we did that and, you know, things were going great between 88 and 93. We're working away, marching down, finding genes. And then Tom Kasky, at, who was then the chair of the genetics department, gave a noon conference where he described the discovery of the myotonic dystrophy gene. Fragile X was discovered the year before that, or two years before, and he described myotonic dystrophy, another trinucleotide, you know, triplet repeat expansion. And I'm sitting there hearing, you know, the, the description how in the mother the repeat is smaller, in the child it's really big, and that, you know, how there's this anticipation because the child has a much more prominent clinical phenotype than the mother. And I'm thinking, this is exactly what happens in my Texas family. That's exactly what I see. I, I've seen generation after generation, the disease is getting have to happen earlier and earlier. My lowest generation had four year old and 10 year old affected. So I became convinced that it had to be a triplet repeat, just like myotonic dystrophy, but maybe, maybe different kind. So we ran to the lab, told my graduate student who was working on this, we're going to stop everything we're doing, we're going to only look for triplet repeats because myotonic dystrophy that has anticipation was a triplet repeat and we'll make oligos for every potential combination of these sequences. And I called Harry, I said, Harry, this is what I just heard that Baylor, they did this and I think it's going to be maybe a triplet repeat. So the region was a million base pair. How about you take one half and I take one half, 
and we start marching and finding any potential repeats that may be expanded in SCA1. So he said, great, so we shared the oligos and we, we did the march and on the same day, April 8, 1993, we both discovered the gene the same day. Was I, it right in the middle? And that's where we found it. He was sending me a fax of the expansion that he detected in his family and I was sending him a fax of the expansion I detected in our family. And both figures made it into that first paper because we're so, you know, they're different families and so on. So I, it was just so exciting to go for five years, you know, working as much as we could together and then to make the discovery on the same day together was really a lot of fun. And from there on we started planning experiments. So all the while you're doing this and focusing on finding this gene, becoming a true geneticist and a pediatric neurologist, you're not able to get Rett syndrome out of your mind. And I read in previous things that you'd written or previous interviews that you weren't having much success getting grants on it either. Correct. So why persist? What was it about that syndrome? Yeah. And then how about your eventual success with finding the gene responsible? I was always trying to find ways to get me closer to one day maybe finding the gene. And the only ways were to keep collecting more individuals so by the time. You know, I had started my own lab, I had samples from over 200 individuals, and to keep finding potentially a rare in individual with either a chromosomal abnormality or maybe a translocation where maybe the gene could be, or perhaps familial cases, those were extremely rare. There were only a couple of them that came my way. So it was really, there were, there were three of them, but one of them told us that the two cousins inherited nothing in common. So really it didn't help us. So, it, and if you look at all the data, you would say, you know, if I was a really hard-nosed scientist, I would have quit very early on. I'll give you examples because I had a patient with a translocation on the X chromosome and I cloned the breakpoint and there's no gene there. So you know, that wasn't going to be it. And then we had this family where second cousins, second half cousins, both had red, but they shared nothing as far as their uh, genome on the X chromosome with their, you know, through their parents. So any logical person would have quit. So why did not, why did I stay with it? it I think it was the phenotype. It was the clinical picture. It felt to me so consistent that only an underlying genetic defect could give you this exact classical feature of Rett syndrome where you start off being normal and then you do quite a few things a normal baby will do for a year to a year and a half and then you gradually lose that, you lose language if you had language. The hand ringing, I'm, I'm, I'm a pediatric neurologist trained in one of the largest programs. I saw a lot of different things but you never see that, I never saw that prototypical hand wringing except in Rett syndrome and then all the other features that you see, you know, the inability to move, yet, yet you have the strength to move, this freezing, the tremors and so on, the dystonia, the hyperventilation and then apnea alternating, very unique. All of the things I saw collectively, when you put them together, you don't see those all together in any other individual. So I was convinced I, and that's one reason. The second reason I really wanted to understand it, as a child neurologist and even adult neurologist, because SCA1 is an adult disease, uh, there are two types of disorders. There are those that are really developmental. So when the child is born, the brain is abnormal, and it's obvious at birth. And those that are degenerative, where the child is born normal, but with time they will lose milestone, but you see cell loss in the brain, you see atrophy and there's massive degeneration. Rhett did not fit either. They're born normal, they lost milestone, but they had no degeneration. And I wanted to know why. What, what could that be? So it was really those two things that kept me persistent. And that I couldn't, the girls became part of my life. I couldn't take them out of my mind. I really want to understand it. And maybe if we understood it, we can do something. So that's why I persevered and uh, there were a lot of challenges. There were papers published saying this is not an X-linked disorder. There were you know, grants rejected because people said it's impossible to find a sporadic disease gene. By then, no sporadic, nobody had discovered a sporadic gene. 
uh, a, a gene causing a sporadic disorder. So it was really hard to imagine that this would be the case. So you're returning from Lebanon, you hear your phone ringing as you've got the key in the door and it's your postdoc telling you, right. lo and behold, she thinks she might have found a genetic mutation. Right, so that's exactly right. I had arrived uh, on an Air France flight, <laughs> got home around 4.30 and the phone was ringing. I said, how long have you been calling? She said, constantly. <laughs> so she kept on calling, hoping that the minute I'll get in, I will pick up um, the phone. And I said, just, and the kids were young and so on. I said, well, you wanna just bring your notebooks and come? And she did. And we sat down and I looked at the data and I just had chills you know, down my spine. I couldn't believe it because I've had so many red herrings. You know, I've told you about, I had many chromosomal abnormalities where I would be excited, clone the locust, there's nothing there. I even had mutations that are null allele, but then I'll discover them in the father. So I know that this couldn't be causing red. So you've had so many you know, failures, you know, along the way after 16 years, it's going to be very tough for this to happen. And you see now in patient after patient that there is a null mutation, a mutation really inactivating, and you don't see it in her parents. So this was like, she showed me half a dozen right away. So I knew this must be it. So what do we now know about MECP2, right? Or MECP? Uh, yeah, uh, methyl CPG binding protein 2. I call it MECP2 for short. Uh, what we know is we know a few things. I just came from a day and a half at the RET meeting. We know it binds DNA, it binds uh, methylated DNA, and more than one type, it binds it either methyl CG or methyl CA. And now there's even perhaps additional nucleotides might help that signature. Uh, so uh, we know that it is a methyl cytosine binding protein. We know it's important for almost every cell in the brain. We know that somehow it orchestrates the levels of genes in the brain. Exactly how it does that is still a little bit of a mystery. I think we know it interacts with co-repressors, but the gene expression changes in the brain are quite complex. And exactly how it is regulating um, the level of certain genes we don't quite understand why and how and are these changes is what's driving disease. But what we do know, we know that it's essential for every, the function, the normal function of every brain cell. This is why when you have a mutation in half of the brain cells, you pretty much have this function of every part of the brain. So you see symptoms that you will see in so many different neurological diseases because every part of the brain is affected. We know that you need it all the time. If you have it and you're in animal studies and it's a mature adult, you take it away. We know now they're gonna get the symptoms, so you, you really need it all the time. We also know that if you have a RET model and the animals have this, the symptoms, uh, the lab of Adrian Bird and Rudy Yenish found that if you the, those two labs initially found that if you bring it back, you can also correct some of the symptoms. So we know that the brain is really still intact, is that for the brain to function properly, it needs this molecule to bind methylated cytosines and to somehow orchestrate uh, a gene expression program. So we know all these things about it now, and we also know it's, the brain is extremely sensitive to its levels. We discovered through creating an animal model that if you have twice as much the levels of this protein, you can also have a devastating neurological syndrome. It's now recognized. Many geneticists around the world have seen patients with that, the MECP2 duplication syndrome. So you lose it, it's bad, and you have extra copy of it, it's bad. If you have more copies, it's even worse. So the brain is extremely sensitive to the levels of I've, this protein. I've heard you call it the Goldilocks protein. That's right, before. that's right. You it really just... is, you have to have it just right. So you spoke to something that leads into my next question. Now that you've seen that you can ameliorate symptoms in an animal model by adding back MECP2, what does this mean for RET patients? So the challenge 
I mean, I think that there's two things it means. The first thing it means that the brain, the rat brain is receptive for intervention once we find the right intervention. The second, the second thing it means we have to find a way for the rat patients to perhaps either replace the protein or do something that replaces its function. And we have to do, for the patient with the extra copy, something that mm -hmm. lowers the level of this protein. So tell me a little bit about your approach to mentoring, because you're from this model of persistence pays off. So mm -hmm. how do you select for that? And how do you choose the people to be in your lab? And then what do you work on with them? Do people get their own projects? In looking at your CV of 300 or so publications, you have a very short author list, so small group sets of people that it looks like to me you work with very intensively. So what's your approach to mentoring? So my approach has been um, to, to you know, entice people to really do it for, for themselves, for their own. I mean, I, I, the first thing I do is I select people who are really passionate about science and self-motivated. To me, I think this is the most important criteria because if they don't have that, that's not something I can impart on anyone. I can impart everything else, you know, but that part, that motivation, that drive to really being curious and to wanting to do the best you can do, uh, I, I look for that, I look for that drive. The second, uh, I, I have, I'm very simple. I have really two criteria I look for in my people that I hire, motivation and generosity. Because if you have this combination, it's phenomenal. If you're motivated, then you will always find a way to do the experiment right. You'll always try to look for ways to find solutions when things seem to be so hard and difficult. And that's really motivation sort of is what keeps you to persevere. And if you're generous, that means you share. You share within your own lab, you share outside your lab. And when you share, people are so happy to help you back. And that will generate a lot of positive feeling in the lab. And I, I always encourage people in my lab to collaborate. I have enjoyed the model of collaboration with Harry. I want them to experience that in my own lab. So these are really, I would say, my two biggest uh, things I look for in people I hire in the lab. And then once they are in my lab, I try to mentor them in various areas. So after having heard you talk for the last 45 minutes, um, you know, I've gotten a true sense of the things that have motivated you. And I heard about your early interest in biology, then switching to literature, and now how absolutely fulfilling your career has been. So if you had to do it all over again and you couldn't be a scientist, mm. you couldn't be a clinician, what do you think might have motivated you to be as quite as persistent and tenacious in your life? I think um, I like to solve problems. So I don't know exactly really if I have to do it all over again what I would do, but it would be something, that's what I enjoy the most. I, I feel, I put my mind, I want to solve a problem and I stick with it. Um, so I think I would probably try to figure a way to solve some problem. Can't tell you in which domain, it could be anywhere from, you know. In Politics? It could be, you know, I, I, trust me, I would love to find a way to really, and I would think and I'll put energy into it so that really we can, you know, turn things around and make people, you know, through hope and education do better things than, you know, help mankind than some of the things we're seeing around us, so definitely. So I think that that problem solving, I would say, is really at the root of what I enjoy the most. And I wouldn't know what the field could be, but I would, it has to be something that I'd like to solve a problem. Well, I certainly see you're vibrating with passion about the problem you've chosen to solve. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining me today, Huda. It was thank a you pleasure so much. to speak to you.